Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Lisa Raitt. I'm Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking at CIBC, former politician, truth be told, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today for this very, I think, interesting panel, certainly one which anybody who's tuning into this conference would be interested in. I have the chair and the CEO of the Canada Infrastructure Bank with me today, Tamara Broman and Aaron Corey. And we're not actually going to have a PowerPoint presentation or any kind of five or 10 minute. We're not gonna burn your time. We are here to take questions and whatever questions you don't have, I will be able to put to both Tamara and to Aaron. But I encourage you to write your questions in. I can see them as they come up on the screen. And uh, we've all agreed that asking questions could be the best way to get the most information out of this session that's possible. I'm delighted that Tamara and Aaron are in the positions that they're in right now, because rarely do you see uh, two individuals uh, in a single entity that have both private sector experience, but also public sector leadership. And something as tricky as infrastructure in Canada certainly needs to have both of those things married together. And each of these individuals have that. So I don't have any questions that have appeared on screen yet, but I thought perhaps I can start with the chair of the board, Tamara, and just get your get your insight into where you think the CIB is going and fulfilling the mandate. And as well, pointing out that you have a new minister who also has great experience in the name of Dominique Leblanc. And um, just your sense as to what is ahead for you as the chair going forward. And then we'll turn to Aaron on the same question. Thanks very much, Lisa, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to all of those who are joining in. It's great that we have this opportunity to talk to you about the Canada Infrastructure Bank and take your questions. Well, infrastructure certainly uh, has been a very popular uh, topic over the past several years, uh, but I'm coming to you from British Columbia today where I can tell you infrastructure is going to be the main focus uh, for many, many weeks and months ahead, given the devastating floods we've had here. And I think what we're seeing at the infrastructure bank really coast to coast is a focus on getting more projects done uh, across a variety of sectors that really are going to lay the foundation for the future economy and society that we need uh, in this country. And so we've been very, very busy over the last eight months in particular, focused on getting projects built, everything from uh, uh, clean tech and uh, energy projects all the way through to zero emission buses, to broadband, the ability for us to participate this way today, right across the country, something clearly that's needed on the infrastructure side, to connecting Indigenous communities. And we have a board of directors that has very deep experience in infrastructure, finance, as well as very representative from the communities right across the country. And now with Aaron's leadership, really pleased at the amount of deals we've put through, uh, over seven in the last eight months, and uh, we're really looking forward to working with municipalities, with provinces who, as you know, own a majority of infrastructure in our country, as well as Indigenous communities and the private sector to get more built for the kind of uh, infrastructure that we're going to need for the country going forward. It's an exciting and a bit daunting time uh, to be in the infrastructure business, uh, but I think it's actually a very, very uh, good time to have as a country an uh, organization like the Canada Infrastructure Bank that can be focused on uh, bringing these deals together uh, to get the best of the public and the private sector. Okay, Aaron, over to you. Hi, Lisa, nice to see you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can't wait for next year when hopefully we're back doing this in person, not from the impersonal, yeah. but antiseptic co corner of, uh, of an office. It's, uh, as, as Tamara said, the, I've, I've been in the role about a year, Tamara less than that, and we've had, I think, um, a really incredible opportunity. The bank, the bank is a platform that has the real potential to get in more infrastructure built faster in this country. And Lisa, last fall, uh, the CIB developed this idea of the growth plan. It was a pragmatic kind of a look at where are the infrastructure gaps that in the near term we can address. You, you face the challenges of COVID and of economic recovery coming out of it. And as we know, infrastructure happens at two speeds in this country. There are 
mega transit projects, which often take years from de- conception, political galvanization, community alignment, de- you know, design and engineering, construction. That's a that's a decade journey and 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 more. You you and I, Lisa, probably both could name projects that uh, it's decades from their original like on the drawing board. Those are super important. The CIB can play a real catalytic role in bringing those projects to market quicker, in filling gaps that are barriers to those projects happening. But there are, when I say infrastructure happens at two speeds, there are also a whole bunch of projects uh, from zero emission buses, as Tamara mentioned, where we can sign a deal with the municipality and they can start ordering buses and those buses can be on the road six months from now. Or our investment in irrigation infrastructure in Alberta, which from eight months went from hey, is irrigation infrastructure to funded? And so I think the growth plan, which was the CIB's three-year uh, spending plan, if you will, really highlighted that though we need to work at both of those speeds. And Tamara and I are both baseball fans. We sometimes say, you know, you, Tamara has this great line about, you know, American baseball and Japanese baseball. There's the swing for home runs only and strike out a bunch too, or there's the bunt, steal, and dink and dunk your way to runs. Both score your runs. And we're trying to take a blended approach. It's how we think of our portfolio. How do we invest in those mega projects? And how do we also get real traction on the ground and real deployment? And as Tamara said, the outcome of that year, that decision or that pivot a year ago is really clear. We've now gone from one investment in the REM project, which was for the first few years of the CIB, our signature project, to today where we've made 20 investment commitments in total, 11 of those where credit agreements are in place, funding is happening, and the other nine where we have agreement on a term sheet and we're now finalizing. But that's to go from one of those to 20 uh, in the last 13 months or so. And that is still to us, I, I say that only to say that's just the start. And we have we have the attitude of being proud of that progress, but far from satisfied and feeling like that's just the beginning of what can be a real pipeline of, of projects across all of our priority sectors, transit, trade and transport, broadband, uh, clean power and other green infrastructure where we can really apply the tools of the CIB to get more built. OK, you hit the right word because we got a question on pipeline. Aaron, since you said the magic word, you get to answer the question. Why doesn't the CIB publish a pipeline of projects along the lines of Infrastructure Ontario or Infrastructure BC? Well, it's a great question. So two two answers to that. We do have and are constantly tracking, of course, a pipeline of opportunities. They are, as Tamara said, with both the public and the private sector. I think we aren't the same as Infrastructure Ontario, and I, I say this with some relevant experience in the sense that our our as investors, we're out proactively cultivating those things. We are out, you know, talking all the time with private owners of infrastructure saying, hey, have you thought about expanding this project? We announced, I'll give you an example. We announced last week or maybe two weeks ago an investment with N-Wave to expand significantly and build on their existing uh, district energy system. Great project, extremely important for meeting our green targets and our GHG reduction targets. And a really cool place for the bank to play, Lisa, because it's the kind of project where N-Wave has expansion plans. They were already working on that. We didn't come up with that. That was their project. We went to them and said, what if together we oversize that project? We built it bigger than it might have otherwise been. We can provide patient long-term capital to allow that to happen. Okay, so how would I put that in a pipeline? You know, that's 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 a bespoke opportunity that we are cultivating with N-Wave. And until we do, that's a proprietary, we're not putting things out to tender. So I don't think the concept of a pipeline in the exact same way will ever quite be relevant. But but we are actively working on, on the idea of how do we provide more keys like that to the market. So maybe it's not that project, uh, District Energy in Mississauga, Etobicoke and Toronto, um, but it is about thematically where we want to make investments and the kind of opportunities we're pursuing. And we're going to put out a letter actually today that does a little bit of that. So f- stay tuned. I like the question. It wasn't a plant, I promise, but our plan is to put out a, a note later today in spirit along the same lines of an IO type of market update that talks about progress to date, some of the things I've just been talking to you about, but also as we look forward, where are the key themes, key subsectors, key types of projects that we're looking for? And that's a call, rather than thinking of it as a pipeline of things someone could bid on, think of it as a call from us for good ideas, for investment proposals, and for opportunities. That's how we've treated it, and so uh, stay tuned. 
OK, I'm going to go to you on this quick question and then to Tamara on a broader policy question. Um, the question is, how much private capital has CIB crowded in to date? Great, great question. So here are our stats. As I say, now up to these 20 investment commitments, they represent about $6.3 billion of CIB money. And just over that, a close to $7 billion in private capital. The total project value, by the way, if you wanted the last of the numbers to finish this, the triangle, is that they are worth, the total value of those capital projects is about $18 billion. So there's 6.3 of our money, there's 6.8 or 9 of private capital, and the remainder comes from other levels of government. You know, it might be a municipality who was already planning on buying diesel buses, and so they had an existing budget they were going to put into that, and we're topping that up to allow them to buy electric buses. So it really is all three. It's the CIB money, it's other forms of public money from other levels of government, and it's private capital, but that's about the ratio of them, and uh, and we predict we we expect that to continue. It really varies, Lisa, by sector. We have some, you know, we're doing in uh, projects with indigenous communities to get to clean power, uh, mm -hmm. or or my Zeb's example, zero emission buses with municipalities, where there's pretty limited opportunity, honestly, for private capital in those. Mm -hmm. And we're doing others. Uh, N Wave would be a great example of that, where our partner is. And wave and their owners who are two huge, uh, massive infrastructure institutional investors that have significant amounts of private capital. Some of them are, you know, the ratio is five to one. Some of them, the ratio is less than one to one, but they average out to the numbers I just gave, which is private capital just exceeding our amount in. OK, thanks for that, Aaron. Appreciate it. Aaron mentioned zero emissions vehicles, Tamara. You are the president and CEO of the Vancouver Airport, and it has done, I think, I'm going to give you great kudos, remarkable things in being a sustainable airport, and you're recognized worldwide by ACI and I and A for the work that you're doing there, so well done there. But the question we have is, with renewed focus in the green energy space, how does the CIB envision participating or supporting the application of new and emerging technology? So you talked about ZEVs, but they're wondering about, are you, do you have a role in battery storage facilities, small modular reactors, fuel cells, any of those kinds of things? Does that fit within something that CIB invests in? Yeah, thanks for the question. The uh, and thanks for the compliment. Uh, I think that uh, the way to think about that is is yes and no. So certainly, uh, we are interested in the transition and the technology that will be needed to facilitate that transition. And frankly, we get lots of unsolicited. Uh, proposals and inquiries, as Aaron was saying, from people that are at the pretty, pretty early stages of the development curve with respect to technology. Is that the place where uh, CIB can best play and, and fund and finance infrastructure? No. But can we act in an advisory capacity, making sure that people are connected to the market or connected to the right levels of support uh, in government? We certainly do that. But then there's more established technologies like uh, battery storage, where we absolutely have a role to play and, in fact, have financed some of those deals already with Enerstore being uh, uh, being the chief among them. So as we see the acceleration of technology in the clean tech and the energy sector uh, moving very, very quickly, we are seeing that there's more opportunities to finance infrastructure. But we are decidedly not quite on the uh, bleeding edge uh, end of that, but very keen to talk to folks about how to get that into market and, and proven so that we can be in a position to finance that. And just in the way that Aaron was talking also about how we get information out to market and while the proactive uh, list of pipeline and the way that Infrastructure Ontario is doesn't quite fit for us, as Aaron said, we are very conscious of the fact that we're one of the best kept secrets at the moment uh, in our country with respect to infrastructure. And so we will be publishing the letter later today, but also I think you'll see both management. We've established new offices uh, in the western part of the country, for example, in Calgary to serve the west, as well as Montreal and Toronto, and then also the board out in community and in the market talking to partners and stakeholders and owners about the role that the bank can play. Cool. OK, Aaron, tough question from the audience. Don't blame me for it. Uh, you've had two finance ministers. Tamara is the third chair. You're the second CEO. Four infrastructure ministers, maybe definitely two or three ISED ministers. So the question is, 
Is the mandate still the same from when you were formed in 2017? Has anything changed? And they want to know what's going on with the, the high turnover in leadership. I mean, I know the answer to that, having been a former politician. That makes sense to me. But can we get management's perspective on this kind of churn that the market is seeing and what it means? Sure. So I, I, it's, a, it's a very fair question. And I think the answer is we've gotten much clearer and sharper over the last three and a half years on how nothing's changed in the mandate, but we've gotten much sharper on how to deliver on that mandate. And let me just give two examples. Um, first of all, at the highest level, if the goal is to get more infrastructure built in this country faster, you know, let's just remember that that's the goal. The goal, th there are lots of sub ways to do that. Crowd in private capital, do deals that have revenue. The, these are all markers, but ultimately what we're trying to do is get more built faster to the benefit of Canadians to build the kind of economy and society we want to have. So we always, that has never changed in the mission. The clarity that I described comes from two places. One is government and us working together, and we've had a really good dialogue over the last year, as Tamara and I have been in the job, around what are the outcomes that we're seeking. You know, infrastructure is a, everyone in this conference knows that infrastructure is a funny thing to define. The US, they've spent, I don't know, a year debating what is infrastructure or not. For us, we went back to first principles and this idea of there are lots of outcomes that infrastructure delivers to you. Museums are infrastructure and they deliver a set of outcomes around quality of life in a city. They make it more livable, they attract talent. There's a whole, so the point is you gotta start from what are the goals? And so there are five that the government has clearly indicated to us. And those are the following. One, build an economy that reduces its use of GHG emissions and move us towards net zero while making us competitive globally. So. We look at every investment through the lens of, is it building infrastructure that makes us less reliant on GHG emissions or that cuts our footprint? Two, invest in infrastructure that improves connectivity of Canadians. And there's two, two A and two B. Two A means in connectivity of Canadians through better transit. We know better transit has environmental impact, but it has other benefits like shorter commutes, more time at home with your kids, it makes cities more livable. Oh, it has a whole bunch of ins less particulate in the air. So it has benefits way beyond just the GHG. And 2B, the other kind of connectivity is broadband. And it's no better example than this conference that broadband is something that makes economies work. It also provides healthcare and education to remote communities. It's a lifeblood, especially in a country our size. So that's the second and third object uh, uh, outcome. And the, the fourth one is around growing our trade capacity as a country. And so investments in ports and in rail networks and in the end-to-end -end trade capacity of our nation, because that's fundamentally the kind of economy we have. So we have those four outcomes. And then a fifth one, which is get all of those things, even more importantly or acutely, in partnership and in the benefit of Indigenous communities who have an incredible, em embarrassing amount of gap, embarrassing for us as a country, I mean, in terms of the quality of infrastructure that they live with on a daily basis. So uh, one of our favorite expressions is to talk about double and triple word scores and how do you think about, you can clean power that gets a remote or Northern or indigenous community off diesel meets our GHG emission reduction goals and also our closing the gap goals. Okay, so I tell you all that, that to say, when the CIB was started three and a half years ago, I don't think there was as cl much clarity on the way this should work. And the way it should work is government sets those outcomes. And that's for them to really define. And they could give us new ones, right? I, I, that would be okay. They could say, we're also focused on blank and that would be great. And then it's our job to go find investments where that can be delivered. And we look for opportunities there where there is a revenue source where you can do these deals, not purely on the tax base, but through other funding mechanisms where our financing can share in risk, in a way that gets those projects done. And then it's up to us, the management with our board, to actually source those investments, approve those investments and make them. And government has given us really clear authority to do that. So, and, and that's, a, I think, an important evolution in the CIB. So if they set the outcomes and then they give us the authority to do deals, I wouldn't say that's a new direction, but I would say it's a really clarified one, Lisa. It's what's allowed us to accelerate our momentum. Yeah. It's what means that changes in government personnel, you know, like you asked how many ministers, it it matters, but it matters less because what, what they're doing is giving us those periodic outcomes and then letting us do our job. I agree completely with that. It really doesn't matter who sits in the chair. It's the fact that you have the legislation in place. So Tamara, over to you. 
Aaron says, okay, the job of management is to find an investment. Somebody out there wants to know, what is the bank's biggest challenge in actually getting the projects that you find funded by the bank and I guess by the federal government? We haven't had uh, much difficulty in that, frankly, uh, lately. Uh, once we had the clarity of the mandate in the five areas that Aaron just uh, outlined uh, for you there so eloquently, um, it's been a fairly straightforward uh, activity. I think, you know, in our earlier uh, phase in our startup, we were a startup. It's not every day that uh, that the federal government creates a new crown agency with the kind of mandate and scope that the Canada Infrastructure Bank had. And, and frankly, it took us a bit of time to find the best path forward between the government and a CIB to be able to execute at pace. We've now found that cadence by the virtue of the fact we've gone from one to 20 in 13 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the full support of government uh, to get that done. So we have had really no issues in the last little while with respect to funding. Thanks. Aaron, a specific project question. Can you provide an update on the funding of the Via Rail High Frequency Project, or I should say Via's High Frequency Rail Project? By the Disclosure and you know, spoiler alert, I love that project. So, <laughs> Well, we do too. It's obviously a major priority of the government. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, so we're working with our partners at VIA and with many in the federal government. Uh, I think there's what's clear about that project. And Lisa, you, you, I think you and I have talked about this before. It meets all, if you go back to what I just said a minute ago, go through the list. First of all, it's clearly in those outcomes. You know, you can tick yeah. off it. We, it is connecting Canadians in a totally different way than we are today. It's doing it in a GHG efficient manner because it's quite clear that we would do that project electrified, at least for the vast majority of that network, or with some form of non-emitting or low-emitting technology. It's a place also then, so if it meets those initial screen, then I said the next job is for us to figure out what, what role does the CIB play, and I think, and what role can the market play? And I think there it's also quite clear there's a huge opportunity for innovation on that project. What we often talk in these conferences about risk transfer and and risk. I don't risk transfer ends up sounding like how much can you push to your side of the table versus mine? I think the flip side of risk transfer is innovation opportunity. Uh, uh, the HFR system is complex. It has decisions about route and vehicles and service levels and pricing and how much you charge for it, all of those things that ultimately influence how many people ride. And so I think VIA and us together have developed a really clear view of all of those levers for optimization and, and a view that the private sector can play an important role in helping optimize those. And we as VIA, VIA could, or we could help them, VIA could, could come up with our version of that optimization, but it, I think this is the place where the private sector brings something, they bring innovation. So uh, stay tuned, but government's plan I think is, 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 uh, is clear that we see a meaningful role for the private sector in making that optimization and making the system a reality. And so now it's just about getting down to it. Very cool. Uh, Tamara, for you, in the wake of COP26, are you thinking of extending green financing, sustainability linked loans, and did you look at any circular economy initiatives? Or sorry, incentives, not initiatives. So the short answer is yes, yes, and yes. You know, one of the things we've been talking about recently is not only where we see retro uh, retrofits fit into uh, the circular economy, particularly around uh, the provenance of building materials and the ability to label those and uh, be able to take them back to origin uh, at demolition, but also, again, given the summer and now the winter that we're having uh, in this country and around the world, climate adaptation. You know, how do we finance uh, the adaptation part of climate change to support communities and the economy and the supply chain and all the things we rely on? So certainly climate is becoming a now. I think we will look back and see that uh, 2021 was the year that uh, climate and climate finance really took quite a large step forward. And we're seeing that in our business as well uh, and in our pipeline. And so we will continue to finance the things that Aaron talked about. And as we look forward, look forward to these other areas that you talked about. That's amazing. Aaron, something specific for you. Is CIB looking at getting involved in a TOD-TOC project? What type of role am I CIB take and first of all can you I know everybody else knows but I don't so tell me what those initials all stand for. 
For sure, yeah. The, the question, thank you for the question. It, it really revolves around uh, TOD and TOC transit-oriented development or transit-oriented communities. This is city building in and around our transit stations. As you listen to my outcomes, that I, this is a really good question. The outcomes I described earlier, building new housing stock wasn't one of them. It's a priority of the government of Canada, make no mistake, but it's not one of the outcomes we're focused on. But transit connections are. And so there's an important distinction here. We think transit-oriented development, land value capture, which is sort of the broader concept in and around station nodes, are huge opportunities to help pay for more transit. So that at the CIB, we view them as a tool, means to an end. The end is more investment in transit. The tool is development in and around stations, developments that have a mix of market and affordable housing. They get you more riders on the transit, so they make the transit more profitable. And they create a funding source that you didn't have before to potentially pay for the transit. So the short answer I started with is yes. The CIB sees uh, transit and development as a, as a real opportunity, as a means of repayment, as a risk that's really well suited for CIB investment. Why? Because the thing that's uncertain with it a lot of times, Lisa, is how quickly it'll happen, right? Development is hard to predict. And oftentimes it takes five and 10 and 15 years. You're building huge communities. Some of these projects are master planned out 10 to 20 years. And that's the kind of place where a long-term loan from the CIB, a long-term loan where we share that ramp-up risk, because that's the sort of opportunity we're looking for. That's what our money's best designed for, is to share in that risk and say, until development reaches X point, defer your payment back to us, or we'll do it at a very low interest rate, and it starts to go up as you get more development. So that's that's where our tools can be so effective. We see that as a real opportunity to increase funding for transit, and it's something we're looking at with a number of governments right now. So, Tamara, one of the selling points of setting up a separate bank is the fact that in this world, you need to be nimble and you need to react quickly. And truth be told, the government of Canada is neither nimble nor can it react quickly to anything that it faces. How are you going to ensure as the chair and the, and the board that the organization doesn't creep into bureaucracy? I'm sorry, I just had somebody come into uh, my office here at the airport. So absolutely, uh, one of the reasons that we have uh, the bank is to be able to respond to the market uh, by innovating and by doing things differently while keeping our eye on those long term consistent commitments that are so important in the infrastructure and the finance space in order to build confidence and the kind of robust pipeline that we've talked about. You know, one of the things that uh, I think we focused a lot in this session, quite rightly so, on green finance, but one of the other areas by way of example where we're seeing that innovation and the lead role that the bank can play is in, is, is in the area of financing in Indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. When I first started to finance green projects at Van City Credit Union when I was the CEO there uh, over a dozen years ago, it was a hard sell to those in the finance community around what exactly was the risk and the return, always looking backward, needing to see that uh, demonstrable return before we could really get the mainstream financial institutions confident in that space. We're seeing some of the same things, frankly, in Indigenous communities where there's a huge need, there's a real projects that need to be financed, but frankly, there's some lack of experience and clarity with respect to risk and rate. And so Indigenous communities are finding it hard to source private capital at a rate that's commensurate with the kind of infrastructure that they're building. There, the CIB can go in and demonstrate that, in fact, we can understand the risk, that there is a return, uh, share that with the private sector, and then exit that field so that the market can take over uh, in the correct way. Those kinds of things are the sorts of things we're working on uh, in a way that contributes to the overall infrastructure that gets funded, but also in a way that's innovative, proof of concept, working ahead in partnership with the market and community. And you're not using this label. I'm not putting words in your mouth, but somebody else has asked a question that I'm going to ask in a second. But it seemed to be a far more collaborative way of procurement or a more, I, I would say, progressive way. It's a, it's a form of, of a, a different procurement model. And over to Aaron on this one. As the market attempts to move towards more equitable risk allocation between public and private sector participants, what is the bank's position on a more progressive and collaborative procurement models? And will CIB play 
a role in getting more infrastructure built more quickly under those types of models? Right. So first, we're um, extremely flexible to and agnostic about uh, procurement. I know this is C2P3, Lisa, so I should be careful what I say, but... Uh, uh, it was the number one question, Aaron. We're, 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 we're really not beholden to what... And we, we have examples of projects that follow nearly every form of model, right? Mm -hmm. And so our, our priorities... Uh, and in fact, we're an invest. We're an impact investor. We're trying to buy the outcomes I described to you earlier, while while sharing in the risk of the project in a way that gets those projects built. We are our part. We are not the. We own none of the infrastructure we're financing. We we uh, and we procure, and we're not the procurement agent for any of it either. We, the principles we go back to are all around. Who is the private sector partner that we're working with? How are we sharing risk? I love the expression in an equitable way. Like that's what we focus on. That to us has um, only indirect connection to procurement models, if you will. And so we, we've done a real variety. What I would say, interestingly, like we, I think are, if anything, we're biased towards, I would say the, the pure version of P, like P, the concept of a P3, not the, I don't mean the mechanics and the papers that we use in Canada today, but I mean the basic principles of a P3 in the sense that it's a public-private partnership. It has some form of, of sharing of skin in the game together. Mm -hmm. um, we spend almost none of our time think, thinking about how much risk we can push to the private sector. We spend our time thinking about what are the, what are the gaps to a project happening that we can help share? Is it about customer demand risk or uh, technology commercialization, not technology, as Tamara said, I'm not, we're not really in the world of taking technology risk, but we could take commercialization risk, like as you scale up a technology or do it at a bigger scale. So we spend most of our time thinking, what are those risks that are stopping our project partners, a municipality, a province, a private sector company that are stopping them from building the infrastructure they want and need? And how can we share that with them? And that's, so we're coming at it from truly the opposite end of the telescope rather than what's the procurement model for us. It's what's the risk we can share to help make the project go. Yeah, a tough question for you, Tamara. And then we're going to do a wrap up question for both of you. But uh, somebody wants to know whether or not you see your role limited to mega projects, which tend to be in major urban centers. Or do you have an appetite for smaller or mid-sized projects which are found in more rural and remote areas? And given what we have just seen transpired in the last couple of elections, I think it is fair to acknowledge that there does seem to be an urban-rural divide that may be happening in the country with lots of folks watching what's happening in both space. So what's the CIB's point of view on, on these kinds of projects? We definitely do not have a bias for mega projects only, or alternatively for only small projects, somewhat more obviously. And you'll see in the portfolio that, uh, and the letter that we're about to release today, that we have a very diverse uh, portfolio in the 20 that Aaron talked about. And so we've done quite a bit of good work to be able to pool together, for example, uh, zero emission uh, buses, for school buses here in British Columbia, every school district, you know, probably too small on their own, but when we pool together, we get economies of scale and learning in terms of delivery and efficiency in terms of financing and execution. Uh, the same is true of indigenous communities, you know, how can we pool together the conversion from diesel to cleaner fuel uh, mm -hmm. in a way that gets scale as well as efficient deployment of capital. So I think we're very sensitive to the fact that many of our infrastructure needs are outside the large cities, Obviously, they're also in the large cities and that we need to do both if we're going to have a connected country and a connected economy. Yeah, yeah. I just add, uh, Lisa, one of the things that Tamara hit on this, but when we think about ways to, to, to get to scale, zero emission buses is a great example where we've got a pretty standard offering and you can work with municipalities, large and small or school bus operators. But a different example, it's is around our energy retrofit program where we're looking at an aggregation model so where we can provide a credit facility to a energy services company or a, someone who's going and doing retrofits across a big portfolio of buildings that could be a really big property owner you know a large real estate company who says we have 25 buildings we want to retrofit and let's do that together and we fund them and not don't create 25 spvs but we create a fund for them to renovate all 25 of those 
but it also could be with a more of an aggregator, someone who's going to go out, do the work, do the energy efficiency studies, hire the contractor. So we can almost do some at the at the fund level or aggregation. So mm-hmm. we're doing that on energy retrofits. The Zebs, we're trying to have a so either whether standardizing a product or yeah. using mm-hmm. aggregation. Mm-hmm. Or in the case of indigenous communities, just straight up saying you got to take whatever it is the bank was doing for the uh, large city and scale it to the size of a smaller community. All three of those are, the, are, I think, the three main ways we're trying to get at the diversity of this country. While recognizing that, yeah, there are also those mega projects that we are doing that are that are by their very definition big. Awesome. As we wrap up this uh, this session today, we have about four minutes left. I, I wanted to ask you a question that came in very early from somebody out there, and it's a great way to end our conversation. And I'm going to start with Tamara, and then I'm going to conclude with Aaron. But this person is asking, what advice do you have for young people first starting out their careers in the infrastructure space, and where do you see the industry going in the next generation? So pretend you're talking, it's not my son who wrote the question, but pretend you're talking to somebody who's coming out of university or or just doing their, their uh, engineering degree. Um, what's the future, Tamara? There is probably uh, not in recent times a better time to be thinking about a career in infrastructure than the one that's right before us, whether it's climate, whether it's digitization, whether it's the reorganizing of supply chains and trade routes, whether it's connecting Indigenous and and rural communities. We are a country that's blessed with a large geography and a small population. So infrastructure is essential to the way we uh, function as a society as well as, as an economy. And infrastructure, when you think about it, is all about the future that we want to create. It's about making decisions now that have significant future implications given the long-term nature of uh, infrastructure. And infrastructure is not just about the buildings, right? It's about the outcomes. And so if you're interested in the future, you're interested in climate, you're interested in diversity, you're interested in reconciliation, you're interested in uh, engineering and different kinds of technology, if you're interested in different ways of organizing the economy, all the things young people tell me they're interested in, infrastructure is the perfect platform for you. And I really, really encourage, particularly, frankly, uh, women to become interested in infrastructure. It's uh, it's an area of high growth, high uh, possibility, but also significant future impact. Okay, Aaron, over to you. Did you ever think that you were going to be in infrastructure, Infrastructure Ontario, and now here at the Canadian Infrastructure Bank? Well, first of all, I feel like question's unfair. Tamara has an 18-year-old. I feel like she's answered that question before. She, that was too That was too good. That was really uh, good. Uh, I did not, Lisa, I did not at all think I was going to be in this space. But as I, in my background, some people know, I worked in the private sector for 15 years, and I'm a Canadian, and I'm, I'm a very proudly Canadian. So in my private sector work, I, my clients were railroads, mining companies, oil and gas companies, electricity companies. And I didn't even know that it was infrastructure until you added it all up and thought, hmm, what is the common, that's what we call this space. Yeah. I think it's, it's to me, it's, I, I gravitated to those things though, for the reasons that Tamara said, because they're a big part of making Canada what it is and making our economy and our country function and be its maximum potential. When I then overlaid 10, 15 years ago now that that was the space I was in, but also when you look at where those spaces were going and the imperative to do them better, to do them in ways that are more sustainable, that are more uh, protective of our uh, natural environment, that are more thoughtful about the outcomes that they achieve, that's when I turned to the good side and we joined the public service at IO. And it was this opportunity to marry what I had been doing with the sense of public contribution and getting stuff built, which just really appealed to me. So no, it was not on my dance card when I made up my, when I met with my guidance teacher or when I graduated from university or when I did an MBA, none of those. It was only as my career evolved and as I realized what makes Canada tick and what makes me tick a little bit. I would strongly recommend it to any young person, that's for sure. It's a great space. It's not only found in the public sector, you can do it from the private sector point of well, uh, point of view as well. I was in public and now I'm in private sector and you can equally make an impact on this country in either path that you choose. 
Thank you so very much to both of you. It was a very quick conversation, but a very important conversation for those who are tuning in today and those who are interested in public infrastructure and infrastructure in general in Canada. I want to thank you very much. And I'll give a last minute plug to the letter that you'll be releasing later today. Go to the Canadian Infrastructure Bank's Canada Infrastructure Bank's website and you can check out what they're up to. Thank you so much, Tamara. Thank you so much, Aaron. And back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you.